isn't that the truth? So good morning to all of you this morning. How are you? It is good to see you. I think we have weathered maybe the worst part of this storm. I don't know that we've got another one on the horizon, but uh, it looks like with all the heavy rain yesterday and uh, the little warmer weather, uh, oh, the ice is gone in my backyard and I'll be down at the church a little bit later and I got, I'm hoping and praying that the ice is all gone down there. I sure missed being together with all of you yesterday, but we had a great day, great group of people online and we praise God for that. Rick, Lena, it's good to see you. Pray you're getting better each day, day by day. And uh, as well as Teresa, since uh, you told us that Teresa was feeling uh, bad, and uh, uh, that's okay. You guys keep passing it around. Let's stop that. Let's get well and uh, get on our feet. Miss Ruth, good morning to you, and a shout out to Mr. Ken. It's good to see you guys this morning. Debbie, it is great to see you up there. No power. It's been a little hard. Your power's been on and off, but I guess it's on now, and hopefully it's staying that way. So good morning. Good morning to you and all your great, wonderful family. There's my sweet Miss Sherry. Your love uplifts my heart. The earth is filled with his glory. Absolutely right. Daniel, good morning. I pray you're at work and doing well and being careful. Teresa, uh, they they said, oh, BS day, you're not feeling good, so you got to get well too, all right? Alyssa, good morning. We are back from our speech and debate tournament. Okay, lots of learning done. We are praying for everybody. God bless you. It's good to see you. Kara and Cam, Cody, uh, God bless you. Did you, I loved speech. I loved debate. Uh well, you might be surprised that I like both of those areas, but uh, uh, I did, and uh, it's it's just, you know, you know we, we say, well, we're going to have political debates. Those aren't debates, people. Those are just talking points, all right, and screaming and yelling at each other, and accusations. It's not real debate, so at any rate, uh, I do diverge, do I not? Miss Linda! Good morning, good morning, good morning. Talk to Bill, by the way, uh, everybody yesterday, and he's doing well. He's doing fine. Uh, his power was on and off, and uh, it's on now, and uh, uh, he wasn't able to uh, listen to us on uh, uh, Sunday because his power was kind of on and off, but uh, he's going to pick it up uh, later. His uh, Facebook went down, so he gonna, was going to go out and listen to it on YouTube, so... Uh, uh, we'll catch up with him and see how things are going. And if his technical problems all taken care of, uh, we love you all and thank you for your prayers. That was interesting. I bet, I bet, Debbie, that the last several days have been pretty interesting for you guys. Uh, living, you know, we have become so accustomed to all of the stuff that we have and everything, you know, with electricity that when we're thrown back into the primitive state without electricity, it makes life a little, because we're not set up for that anymore, are we? Uh, we're really not. Uh, when I was a kid and, you know, the power would be out for for days, really, uh, for us as well. We always, we, we had a Wood burning coal stove that we cooked on, and it was, you know it was our cook stove, and you know we didn't think anything about it. We had oil lamps that uh, we'd light, and you know we'd we'd have days. Uh, uh, sometimes I can remember uh, going weeks without electricity, and uh, you know we got along just fine. It was interesting, but boy, don't do it now. Don't do it now. Everything we've got depends upon it, does it not? Miss Laura, I love you, my sweet girl. It is good to see you up there this morning. Therese, blessings on you. I appreciate so much uh, the help that you give to uh, Jessica and to Sadie. Pray for Sadie. Sadie had 101 uh, plus temperature last night. Hopefully she'll wake up without one this morning. Miss Betsy, God bless you. I don't know whether you're here or on the other side of the hill, but it's good to see you up there this morning. Miss Sue, good morning to you as well. Good morning. Uh, Bunny sick, need to go to uh, uh, version doctor. Okay, 
Uh, vision, uh, okay. Uh, Miss Stacy, heart, 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 heart to you too, my girl. What a sweet, sweet young lady Miss Stacy is. I wish you all could beat her. She's such a sweet, sweet lady. And uh, Mr. Daniel, it, it, it was definitely difficult, but I was uh, handling uh, business. I bet you were. I bet you were handling business just fine. All right. Well, we 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 go to pick up. We're going to move forward. We did have a great worship time yesterday. Thank you for all the responses back. All the responses that were posted out there and uh all of uh uh, the number of people that were out, I pray that God was able to uh, to speak to you, that uh, he, his spirit, the, uh, the vision doctor, uh, Miss Sue going to the, uh, okay, so y'all pray for Miss Sue. All right, so we're looking at God on trial. Uh, we call this God in the, in the hands of angry sinners. Now, we discussed his travels, right? How that morning, I, I, I do this because I want you to see that by the end of that day, could you imagine the exhaustion that everybody was feeling? All of the disciples, because they had been following this path, but especially Jesus, by the time he gets to the cross, you know, and from there, yeah, they go out to the, to, to the Mount of Olives where he's rested, uh, at the Garden of Gethsemane, comes back to uh, the complex of the high priest. He bounces back and forth between Annas's house and Caiaphas. You know, from there they drag him all the way back up to the Temple uh, Mount and back up into the council room, the chamber room of the Sanhedrin. Uh, and uh, you know, so he has been spending a lot of time uh, marching all over the place. Okay, but he meets this head on. Uh, with full confidence, uh, standing in, in holy confidence. The high priest's case is, is pretty shaky. Uh, since witnesses that they put forward, they can't get their story straight, uh, and their stories are inconsistent. So uh, he steps up his game. Uh, but Jesus doesn't respond like he thinks he will. Uh, therefore, he pursues another course because his murderous intent is not going to be denied. In some way, he's going to get Jesus to incriminate himself or get witnesses that will incriminate him that he can bring capital offense charges against him. Uh, but in stark contrast to this, this kangaroo court, uh, we see the, the, the confidence at which Jesus just stands before them. The high priest stood up and he came forward, questioned Jesus, saying, do you not Answer, what is it these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent, didn't answer. And again, the high priest questioned him and saying to him, are you the Christ? Are you the son of the blessed one? Doesn't ask him if he's the son of God. Are you the son of the blessed one? Jesus answered. Now here's his answer. I am. And what he has to say really knocks their feet out from under them. I am, that great I am statement again, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with clouds from heaven. Uh, the high priest he, he keeps poking, keeps prodding. You know, uh, these are serious charges. Don't you have a response? He's frustrated and he's taunting. But the answer that Jesus gets him is a powerful, powerful truth. Look at this verse 62 again. Let's, let's just pick that one out. He says, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with clouds of heaven. Oh, the confident authority of Jesus. By this statement, Jesus is claiming both to be God's Son and the judge of all their judge. They're standing in judgment to him, and he's saying, folks, 
you got this all turned around. I'm the one who judges you. Uh, by the statement he's, he's claiming. He's making incredible claims. Uh, it was taught by the rabbis that only Yahweh, only Jehovah, could, I, could, could identify the Messiah, and only, only Yahweh, only Jehovah, could appoint him at the right hand of the place of highest honor. For the reference to the coming on clouds was an Old Testament phrase pointing to God in his glory. So what he is doing, he is unapologetically confessing his deity, and they get it. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you that you brought us through this weekend with uh, all of the storms and all of the ice. Lord, for a week, we've had our people that have battled uh, with power and getting their power up and getting it going. Uh, 300,000 people in our area that had been without power. But God, you sustained our folks. You kept them safe, kept them strong. Even, even I think of uh, uh, Roger and Hannah with a tree coming down on their, their house and their garage, and you spared them physically. We thank you for that, Lord. Now we start a brand new week, a brand new look at your word. Pray, Lord, that you will open up our heart, give us insight and understanding, wisdom that we deeply need, wisdom that is beyond us. Because as Paul says, when he speaks to the Romans or writes to the Romans, all the depths of the riches, both of the knowledge and the wisdom of God. We'll never be able to plumb those depths, Lord. But Father, we come not wanting to lean upon our own knowledge, our own wisdom, but to abandon ourselves to you. Bless us now, Lord, as we come to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. By the way, I would tell you, some of you that uh, were there uh, Friday, you got the fireworks display and everything, as Friday was 1,000, so that makes today 1,001. We get to start all over with number one, all over again. The B and B's are there. Hello, Brenda, and hello, Brent. Good morning to you. I didn't forget you. It's good to see you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And God bless your dad. Uh, we, we, we love you guys. You are special, special. All right. Let's move forward. To claim to be the son of David, the Messiah. Now, that wasn't a capital offense. But claiming to be God's son was considered blasphemy and therefore grounds for capital punishment. In verse 62, Jesus says, I am and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with clouds from heaven. Here, Jesus is referring to, to two specific messianic prophecies uh, that, that point us uh, to God. In Psalms 110 and in Daniel 7. In Daniel 7 and verse 13, he says, I, 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 Daniel sees a vision. He says, in my vision at night, I saw in front of me someone who looked like a human being coming on clouds in the sky. He came near to God, who has been alive forever, and he was led to God, and he was given authority, glory, strength of a king, and people of every tribe, nation, language will serve him. His rule will last forever, and his kingdom will be, never be destroyed. Do you see the picture? Do you see the picture of the ascended Jesus? coming back into heaven on, on, on clouds. Remember when you go to Acts chapter 2, he's caught up in clouds and, and you know they, uh, they, they watch him, or Acts chapter 1, watch him ascend into heaven. 
where there he receives his kingdom and he sits at the right hand of power on high. We know that he's there, remember, because when Stephen was stoned, remember the heavens opened up and Stephen looked up and he saw, he saw the Son of Man, he saw Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father and standing. Do you see this picture that Daniel has now? I know we went through Daniel some time ago, a couple years ago now, I guess. Because we went through Daniel, then Revelation. But uh, do you see this picture, this vision of Daniel? We covered this when we were in Daniel, if you remember. This is a picture of the ascended Christ coming back and being presented to the Father and receiving his place at the right hand of the Father, receiving his kingdom. But then comes the coup de grace. Uh, in, in Psalms 104, verses 1 through 4, look at these verses. You can write them down or flip real quick there. You, some of you are getting pretty quick at uh, flipping back and forth You're in your Bibles. But look at this. And the Lord said to my Lord. <laughs> I love that. And the Lord said to my Lord, sit by my right side until I put your enemies under your control. The Lord will enlarge your kingdom beyond Jerusalem, and you will rule over your enemies. Your people will join you on your day of battle, and you have been dressed in holiness from birth, and you have the freshness of a child. The Lord has made a promise that will not ch and, and will not change his mind. He said, you are a priest forever, a priest like Melchizedek. Remember Hebrews? Remember our study of Melchizedek? The type of Christ? And Jesus has a priesthood according to the priesthood of Melchizedek? See, he was answering the high priest question. He was putting his divine sovereignty on display and at the same time proving the depravity of Israel's shepherds, their depravity. Now, the last couple of Wednesday nights, we've looked at God's judgment of these supposed shepherds of Israel and his solution to the problem. And we see it all playing out before us. We see Ezekiel 34 coming to fruition. In verses 1 through 3, he says, Then the, Lord, uh, then the word of the Lord came to me and said, Yeah, see, Psalms to Ezekiel 34. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, thus says the Lord God, woe shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourself with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Isn't that an incredible description of the priesthood uh, as it had become in Jesus' day. All dressed out in, in, in the finest of garb, living in the best of a rich beyond their means, fleecing the people. Annas' uh, uh, bazaar that was set up, you know, there in the court of the Gentiles was fleecing and bilking the people out of their, out of their money costing them exorbitant wages just to be able to, to, to buy something, to, to sacrifice for, 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 for the Passover. Oh, people, it's an apt description of these priests. This is what God says to you. There. I am against the shepherds. I will blame them for what has happened to my sheep, and I will not let them tend the flock anymore. Then the shepherds will stop feeding themselves, and I will take my flock from their mouths so that they will no longer be their food. Jesus, whom the Sanhedrin proposed to judge, is claiming to be king and judge of all the earth, theirs, and that one day he would stand be they would have to stand before him and he would be their righteous judge. So what we have is a righteous king 
standing before the unrighteous shepherds. These men had absolutely no tolerance for the truth. They were blind, could not see the very Lord of righteousness himself, who would one day set in judgment over them and was standing before them. Had they, they would have been on their faces before him. They were completely unaware that they were witnessing the divine fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. Jeremiah 33, verses 14 through 16. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will do the good thing I promised to the people of Israel in Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a good branch sprout from David's family, and he will do what is fair and right in the land. At that time, Judah will be saved, and the people of Jerusalem will live safely, and the branch will be named, The Lord Does What Is Right, or The Lord My Righteousness. Jehovah Chedescu. When Jeremiah wrote this book, God's people were in exile in Babylon. The northern kingdom had been taken away some years before to Assyria. Jerusalem, the temple, had been destroyed. God raised up prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and others, who called God's people to repent of their sin and turn back to him. If they did so, God promised to forgive them. Jerusalem and the temple would be rebuilt. And they would once more live in the land in peace and safety. And this passage, and, and, and another one in, in, in Jeremiah 23, verse 5 and 6, are all part of those promises. The kingdom would be restored. And a righteous king of the lineage of David would rule once more. He would be called Jehovah Chedescu, the Lord our righteousness. The Jews did return to their land. Jerusalem and the temple was rebuilt. But no king ever ruled over the land after exile. Instead, a priestly elite grew up, which over time became more and more corrupt. Governed uh, under the general oversight of the Persian Empire, and then the Greeks, and now the Romans. God's plan for his people were never fully realized because they never fully returned to him completely. Now, both, most Bible scholars see these two passages in Jeremiah as referring to the Messiah, to Jesus, the righteous branch that rises up. The Messiah who would come and bring righteousness to all who accept him as Lord and Savior. Jesus is Jehovah Chedescu, the Lord of righteousness. Let me take you down a little small side trip at this juncture. What does Jehovah Chedescu, Jesus Chedescu, uh, our Lord of Righteousness, mean to you? Why is it important that Jesus is the answer to, to this prophecy, Jehovah Chedescu, the Lord, my righteousness? What does his righteousness mean to you? Well, first of all, the Bible is clear that you and I have no righteousness of our own. Paul makes it perfectly clear in Romans that there is none righteous, no, not one, but that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All, not some, but all. Good morning, Michael. It is good to see you out there this morning. Uh, you're at work too, I assume. You be very careful. And uh, by the way, I would say congratulations on your promotion. So everybody, uh, that's a good Blessing. More work, but good blessing. Even those things that we think are righteous about ourselves, Isaiah says, are nothing more than soiled rags. Well, the second thing is 
not only do we have no righteousness of our own, but it is impossible. Uh, I am, uh, and about that careful, you know, thing. Uh, okay. It is impossible for us to achieve righteousness on our own efforts. Jeremiah poses the question in Jeremiah 13, 23, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leper his spots? Then may you also do no good who are accustomed to do evil. You see, it's not something I can do of myself. I cannot, I cannot live the righteous life God calls me to by myself. I must have his life living through me. Any righteousness that I have has to come from someplace. And this means that Jesus Christ is our only source of righteousness. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, He, God, made him who do no sin, that'd be Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, that you and I might become the righteousness of God in him. And Paul declares in, in Acts 4 and verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no name under heaven given among men by which we may be saved. And the fourth thing I want you to see out of this is Jesus, Jehovah Chidescu, the Lord our righteousness, offers to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He offers us his righteousness as a free gift when we accept him, surrender to him as Lord, receive him as Savior. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. His righteousness covers our sin. Isaiah 61 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and has covered me with a robe of righteousness. The moment you came to Christ, the moment you surrendered your life to him. All your sin was washed away. He put upon you the very helmet of salvation. He gave you a garment and a robe of righteousness. You could not have attained that for yourself. He took off you the filthy rags of your own self-effort and put on you the glorious, white, shining raiment of his righteousness. Washed in the blood, made clean by the sacrifice of Christ, clothed in him restored as Adam was originally. Almost. Because you and I still have that sin nature we struggle with. But what happened when Adam sinned? At, you know, oh, I keep coming back to this because I, I think it's so vitally important that we understand what what is happening in these two scenes. Everything that Adam lost through his sin, Jesus regained for us. Adam had been clothed in the holiness and the righteousness of God. You see, when, when they said that they hid themselves and they made clothes because they were naked and ashamed, it wasn't as if they had not seen themselves without physical, w w without clothing before because they, they were not created with clothing. But they were covered anyway when they were see the when, when they saw each other they, they saw each other for the first time with the glory of god the righteousness of god removed from them when they sinned that shining raiment of the glory and righteousness of god was removed 
and they saw themselves as they were, naked, sinful men and women. So they made clothes of leaves and covered themselves, trying to regain that covering. Couldn't do it. Righteousness of their own hands was nothing more than filthy rags or, rags or wilting leaves. But when they left the garden, they're left with clothing that God supplied for them. When you come to Christ, he takes off those filthy rags of self-righteousness. And he puts back onto you the glorious, shining robes of righteousness and holiness. He makes you righteous. You are now holy. Now, I will say again, you can sit there and talk to me all day long about your feelings. I don't feel righteous. I don't feel holy. And I could probably pop back and say, well, there's probably been times when you have not acted righteously or acted holy, but that doesn't take away who you are. When the Father looks at you, he sees the blood of his Son, and he moves past that. When he sees you, he sees the righteousness of his Son clothing you. He sees the holiness that was his Son belonging to you. That's how he sees you. That's why I say it's important for us to know who we are in Christ. I'm not that old man any longer. I'm not that angry, hostile, drunken old man that I used to be. I'm not that ill-tempered, vile person spewing out one obscenity after another. I'm not that person I used to be. Yes. But I'm not that person anymore. I am exactly who God says I am. Now, if I understand who I am in Christ, then I have a better ability to yield up to him to live out who I am. Because I can't live that without him. I can't live who I am apart from him. I just can't do it. It's not possible. It is not possible for us to live the Christian life apart from our surrender to Christ. Lead not on your own understanding. Commit your ways to him. Let his wisdom guide. Let the fullness of his spirit empower you. Be, let him take you today and clothe himself in you and go out and let him live his life through you. That's what he intends. That is his desire. He is Jehovah Chedescu. He is the Lord, your righteousness. Put on the blessed plate of righteousness. God, I am not clothed in my own works. I am clothed in your righteousness. I am girt about with the belt of truth. I know your truth. I'm going to live your truth today. Are you living his truth today. My feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I am not going to be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to the salvation of men, to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. For as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I will live by faith and raise the sword, the shield of faith that quenches the fiery darts of the evil one. And use the sword of the Spirit, which is the active living word of God. That's how you're to live today. That's who God called you to be, how he called you to live. Will you make a mistake through the day? You bet. If you're like me, you certainly will. When you do, let God bring it to mind immediately and give it to him and thank him for his forgiveness and move on forward. 
Don't let the hiccup keep you from moving forward. I close with a little bit of an illustration. Years ago, we uh, flew back to Colorado and uh, uh, Sherry's mom couldn't drive anymore and they were going to sell her car and so we said we would buy it from her and uh, make sure she had the money. So we, we did that. We bought the car from her, flew back to the farm and, and got it and, uh, and drove it down to Denver and got tires on it because it needed tires and made sure it was serviced for the trip back here. And then we drove it home. It was Thanksgiving week. We were planning on being back, hopefully, you know, by, well, we didn't know whether we'd make it by Thanksgiving or not. But at any rate, we'd make our trip home. And, you know, in the trip, every once in a while, the car would just hiccup, you know, miss a beat. And we'd pull it over. We'd find a place, they'd check it out, and they'd, you know, uh, you know and, and off we'd go, and we'd drive well for a while, and then we'd start this uh, all over again. Got to one place, and they had a part they had to order, and they ordered the part and put the part in. The next day we get in, and we're driving home, and, and, and it starts again. Didn't correct the problem. We get it all the way back up here. But, but you see, we, we had hiccups, but we didn't stop the trip. We kept moving forward, kept making the adjustments that needed to be, and kept moving forward. That's the way we are in our life. Oh, end of the story is we brought it in, gave it to Kirk, and, and uh, you know, he's looking at it, and what he discovered was this, that the plug wires were too far away from the plug, and, and we had a couple that wasn't making a proper spark. Very simple fix. Took us hundreds of dollars on our way up here to fix a problem that cost a few dollars. He made that adjustment, never had a problem with the car again, ran until it had almost 200 and some odd thousand miles on, until it just wouldn't run anymore. What was happening is they, to keep Betty from driving the car, they would go out and they would uh, you know, pull the uh, distributor off. And they, she couldn't get it started. It wouldn't run. So, then they, you know, so they went out and put it. But you see, what nobody did, and... and my son, my brother-in-law didn't know it either because he had that same part that we put in, put in there. It was nothing more than plug wires that weren't seated in properly. You see, that's the way we are. Sometimes we have plug wires that aren't seated in properly. And we miss a beat. We make a hiccup. So we make the adjustments. And we drive down the road smoothly until we get a hiccup and it stops our trip we make the adjustments necessary and we move forward my question is are you moving forward or are you up on a rack somewhere not knowing what the problem is or are you driving with a problem stranded on the side of the road oh people each all of us are going to have moments in our day and in our life. But don't let those times stop you. Come to him. Let the master mechanic make the adjustments that he needs. Give it to him. And continue moving forward. He is Jehovah Chedescu. The Lord, your righteousness, who has clothed you in him. Father, I thank you for your love, for the wisdom of your word, and the joy that we have of understanding it. Because, when, Lord, I know if we understand it, it's because you have revealed it to our understanding. You have caused us to know and to to understand if we understand i love the way that word even in the hebrew what it means to get close enough to have rubbed off and if we understand it means that you're rubbing off on us lord oh god i pray that be the case and the father as you rub off on us more and more of you going to be seen 
by those people around us. So today, Lord, may we all make that commitment that today, Lord, I want people to see Jesus more than they see me. Thank you, blessed Lord, almighty God, the Lord, our righteousness, the one who is sitting at the right hand of power on high, the one who is coming again, the ancient of days, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, the Lord, our righteousness. Blessing and honor to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. So we adjust, we confess, and surrender to his forgiveness, and then see ourselves covered in his glory. Correct? Glory, glory, glory. His glory, not gory. <laughs> see, I, I read that glory. I didn't read it gory. So, all right. God bless you. I pray you all have a super wonderful, wonderful day no matter where you are. Have a great, great day. Bless you. See you tomorrow, 9 o'clock.